I don't know. Many people in America may not remember this, but uh, Sarkozy recognized the council from the beginning, already in February. One of France's uh, most disgusting characters, I happen to know this guy, is Bernard Henri Lévy. He's a left bank intellectual, nouveau philosopher and all that. This guy who went to Benghazi, he met with the council. He called Sarkozy from Benghazi and said, look, we need to recognize these people immediately. They are the legitimate government. So Sarkozy, before anybody else, before the UN, before resolution, whatever, recognized these people and start sending French intelligence and you know, covert operation officers to Benghazi to link with these people already there. So this, from the beginning, was a French war. The Americans and the Brits came later. The French and the British redacted the UN Resolution 1973. The Americans came on board because they also saw an opening. But there are so many reasons that Gaddafi was isolated that it, it was impossible. He, he, he reached an end of the line. In fact, I'm writing, as we speak, a story of what red lines Gaddafi crossed. There were so many. Well, you can go let me, forever lining them up, you know. <laughs> in summation, uh, give me your uh, research take on why this happened. We know he was trying to unify Africa, create their own currency, their own water supply. Yes. He was a dictator, but uh, whether it was because of his arrogance or because he cared, he was building up uh, Libya from a backwater to the most wealthy per capita uh, in Africa. That's why so many African nations are you know, still defending him. So I want you to speak to why they went after him. But then in closing, where is this yes. going to go? We were told this was done because there was a humanitarian disaster with a few protesters being killed uh, because it was confirmed a lot of them were operatives and were violent. I'm not defending what happened. The point is yes. all of them weren't just protesters. Now, most of the country without power, water, uh, we know there are confirmed reprisals against black Libyans. Uh, they're just dragging them out of their houses and killing them. Uh, no doubt the Qaddafi forces are engaged in some uh, uh, some reprisals against uh, people as well, but it's not on a racial uh, issue. So uh, where is this going? I mean, did Europe want to knock uh, this country back into the Stone Age like they did Serbia? Is this the Western powers following that policy of deindustrializing any country that isn't part of Western Europe or the United States? Well, basically, Alex, they want to, Libya has to be sold to the rest of the world as an example. So uh, you don't antagonize uh, the Bank of International Settlements in Switzerland. You don't antagonize the Western bankers. You don't antagonize European corporations or Americans, for that matter. You don't nationalize our oil industry. You don't invest in uh, uh, humanitarian projects in sub-Saharan Africa, as Gaddafi was doing. There is, you mentioned, and there, there is a very strong racial element as well. Libya now is turning... Uh, more into an Arab country, perhaps an Arab emirate, than an African country. Prejudice against blacks in, in Libya is enormous, even before, especially from people uh, in eastern part of Libya, in Cyrenaica. There's a report in The Independent today, my friend Patrick Coburn, one of the best reporters in the world. He talks exactly about racial prejudice from the rebels, let's put it this way, against blacks. And it doesn't matter if they had been living for 10, 15 years with a residence permit, uh, legal job, you know, education. It doesn't matter. They see black, sub-Saharan black Africans in block as mercenaries. This is horrible. The, the repercussions can be horrendous. So basically, Libya well, I remember you, be... you and others warning about this. Webster Tarpley, a journalist, yes. historian, three months ago said that in the East, when they took areas, they were lynching and killing blacks who just have as much right as anybody to be in Africa. I mean, it's the, it's the African continent, hence the name Africa. And now the Washington Post and others admit, but it's buried, that yeah, there's big giant piles of dead black people, and they're just taking women, men, you name it, out of their houses and killing them with no proof. And this should be a bigger issue that you've got racial uh, genocide going on or an attempt at it, yes. and it's not even yes. an issue here. It's true, but you know, at least it's, let, let's put it this way, it's a start when you have a Reuters story 
or it's in one uh, page 12b or whatever new york times or washington post at least now they're talking about it because there were massacres on both sides and now you, we have to talk about the fact that there have been massacres basic against black africans basically committed by people from eastern libya exactly Gaddafi's people it's been shown yeah. are killing personnel that they had yeah. uh, in prisons and that's wrong and is a war crime but just to go out and randomly have no proof and just kill people is incredible. Pepe Escobar, incredible information in closing from your over a decade traveling around Central Asia, Middle East, covering this, being the first to break a lot of information that turns out to be very accurate later from your sources and studying this. Where is Libya going to end up in six months, a year? Because there's many tribes, they're all in reprisal attacks now, and the country that's been uh, you know, basically built up uh, and industrialize, what's going to happen to this huge population? Look, uh, looking at the facts on the ground and trying to extrapolate in a very realistic manner, we can say that there a very, there's a very strong possibility of uh, two guerrilla wars in Libya within the next six months. One would be Gaddafi forces against a weak TNC-based government in Tripoli. To answer this question, you must know how many tribes are actually supporting Libya and how many tribes Gaddafi can buy within the next few weeks or months. The second possibility is a guerrilla war by these Al-Qaeda-linked guys, the Islamists, the LIFG people, against NATO in case they are sidelined from power in Tripoli and in case they start viewing pure blowback once again that this is a foreign invasion and we're going to have NATO troops or even if we have troops from the Emirates or from Qatar, they're going to be foreign troops, occupation troops. So you're talking about a triple cross. I'm sorry? You're talking about a triple cross. You, uh, yeah. a double tr cross Gaddafi that tried to make deals seven years ago and coming out of the yeah. cold and give up his WMDs, then bring in Al-Qaeda, double cross them again. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. So we're going to have a twin... Uh, guerrilla war against a weak central government, against the NATO or Qatari uh, Emirates occupation forces. We're going to have a tribal war because the tribes who rebelled against Gaddafi, they are still very, very strong tribes that are behind him, including the Warfala tribe, which is the largest in Libya, almost one million people. And Gaddafi's wife, who just was spotted in Algeria yesterday, she belongs to the Warfala tribe. So can you imagine a scenario of tribal civil guerrilla war at the same time in Libya. It's I'm not saying it's going to happen, but it's very possible. Let's talk again in six months. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Pepe Escobar, for joining us. I know you write for Asia Times and, and your books out. Are, are, are there any sites people should visit to learn more? No, basically Asia Times. I write for Al Jazeera as well, but uh, you can imagine how difficult it is to write for Al Jazeera at the moment. When... Uh, Qatar and uh, Saudi Arabia are involved in a counter-revolution in the Persian Gulf, so it's very tricky. <laughs> I bet, yeah, they've certainly been big time involved uh, helping put in propaganda to, to lead to this uh, in uh, Libya. And I tell you, uh, as this thing unravels and unfolds and this humanitarian crisis deepens, we have to all our, uh, ask ourselves uh, this new model of globalization where they go in and fund rebels to go after the central government, then the West comes in and backs them, this is a definitely a, a, a new form of dirty war. And we haven't even talked about NATO's role, Alex. We could go on forever on that as well. Briefly, <laughs> uh, one minute on NATO's Brief role. Uh, because NATO wants the Mediterranean as a NATO lake. This was approved last December in a summit in Lisbon, it's part of the guidelines of NATO for the until 2020. So Libya was out of the grid, just like Syria is. That's why a lot of people who know how NATO works are saying, sooner or later, there's going to be a NATO intervention in Syria. Because Syria has a uh, Russian naval base, and Syria is not part of NATO or not part of any partnership with NATO. NATO wants to control the Mediterranean for the West, uh, more or less recolonize uh, North and Africa, especially now with Libya as a kind of NATO protectorate. And AFRICOM, which is the Pentagon's African command, finally is going to have a base in Africa. Because for the moment, they are in Stuttgart, Germany, because nobody in Africa wanted them. Now they can have their own base in Libya. So the circle is closed. Well, you're right. Uh, again, uh, over two years ago, we covered in the Obama deception that there would be invasions of North Africa because that was the Pentagon plan. 
uh, I mean, they hide all of this in plain view. Now they've got all those modern military bases, airfields, water supplies. Look out, Africa, because they're going to start the CIA-funded coups and rebel forces are about to spill into all of the country. And uh, now all of Africa is another globalist battlefield. Pepe Escobar, thank you so much for your amazing insights. Thank insight. you, Alex.